This is Later That Same Life, my weekly podcast. I'm Larry Fedorik, covering the stories of the day, both of a personal nature and of shared public interest. Season 3, Chapter 5, Planes, Trains, Cargo Ships, and Trucks. There's your global supply chain. You know, I'm watching one of my favorite holiday movies for the hundredth time the other day. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Neil Page and Del Griffith. Unlikely pairing. Trying to get to Chicago in time for Thanksgiving. And one of the reasons I watch my favorite movies over and over again is to pick up on something that I hadn't noticed or thought of before. On this viewing, right around the spot where Dell nearly crushes Neil's head like a melon, it dawns on me that this is not just a holiday classic. It's a comedic video documentary explaining the global supply chain. The global supply chain is really just a complicated system of transportation that works until it doesn't. You know, everything is delivered and where it's supposed to be until a plane can't fly, a ship can't sail, or there's no one around to drive the truck to your grocery store. It's amazing how much we've learned about it in the last few weeks. And only because it stopped working. It's the light switch mentality. You almost never think about your light switch until that one day you flip it on and there's no lights. What's the problem? Power outage, light bulb, faulty wiring, faulty switch. Could be any of those things. Or what if it's all of them? My point is, the global supply chain is all around us and we rarely notice it. The Pepsi truck is in front of the convenience store. Global supply chain. There's the tanker at the gas station. Global supply chain. Incidentally, have you ever heard this thing before where you're not supposed to buy gas when the tanker is at the gas station? I've always heard this. Something about the trucks filling those big underground tanks and it stirs up a lot of sediment that could end up in your vehicle. I guess. You know, when it comes to paying for gasoline, that would be the least of my worries. You know, even when we're stuck in freeway traffic behind 18 semis, we don't think, hey, there's the global supply chain at work. We only become aware of it when it fails. Excuse me, Mr. Grocer, I I was looking for the uh, big jar with the orange label, you know, the jalapeno on it, what? They didn't come in? Check back Friday? All right. What's this? Amazon delivery delayed. Global supply chain. Even the post office at Christmas, the one time a year I'm counting on you and you can't guarantee delivery? Yeah, I guess I understand. Thanks just the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Terrific. Thank you. So what is a supply chain? Well, that part's easy. It's a network set up between companies, associations, or even nations to produce and distribute a product or service. Simple. Let's go. Well, hold on. I'm going to, let's say, open up a diner. I need vegetables from here, beef from over there, chicken and fish from way over there, appliances from this place. Oh, then there's the appliance guy. Well, he needs his steel from over there, but the nuts and bolts from way over that way, and his electronics from some other place altogether. Well, then there's the electronics people. They get their nuts and bolts from some other place, and they can't even get their silicon chips right now, so no electronics. No stove, no restaurant. Yeah, cancel that order for the carton of tomatoes. Yep, supply chains are a delicate, finicky piece of machinery. And what we've done, we, society we, is made them even more complicated by making it global. To understand the global supply chain, we must first understand the birth of world trade. I guess technically it started when Columbus unloaded his ships in the 1490s. What's this you brought us, Chris? What do you call this? The turnip. Hey, that looks terrific. Nice job. Well worth the trip, I guess. But real world trade started only about 80 years ago. It's actually born out of war in some ways. World War II. 
and nations agreed to band together to defeat the evil Axis powers. This included the movement and exchange of goods and materials. Some may remember the GATT Agreement. 1941 GATT General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade. GATT went beyond a previously shaky, more informal system of importing-exporting. You know, in the day, people wanted their French wine and their Dutch cheese and their fine suits from Savile Row. But GATT was about real-world trade. Not just the goods, but the raw materials required to make them. You need silver? We got mines. You need timber? We've got trees. We'll ravage the planet for a buck. What do you have that we need? As peace allegedly guided the planet, GATT continued. They said, you know, we got something good going here. At least the businesses lucky enough to profit from the war and countries who had offerings and were willing to play ball with the big boys. They could see their economies grow. Made in Japan, made in China. We didn't always think highly of those products. We saw the labels all the time. That was the beginning of world trade. Happening at the same time were innovations in transportation, bigger boats, faster planes. Also, politics and economics of nations varied. In some places, people worked for poverty wages. So goods were cheap and cheaper to transport, easier to profit. The cycle continued as it still does today. GATT begat the WTO, the World Trade Organization, formed in recent history, 1995. Briefly, an organization dedicated to making sure that nothing is made where it's needed but instead made where it is not. So then it has to be shipped to where someone will pay for it. And remember, from the germ of an idea to the finished product in our possession, well, everybody along the way has to make money on that thing. Hey, I am a capitalist. I get it. The world's economy is pretty simple. One person's spending is another one's income. That's the simple system. It works better for some than for others. But world trade does not encourage any one nation to be self-sufficient, too dangerous. It encourages that at least part of an economy be dependent on someone or something else, and thusly be at the whim of the more powerful. So then the goods and services are used like weapons of war. We don't like what you're doing. Sanctions, embargoes, no soup for you. You get the have and the have-nots. You get the first world, developing nations, and the third world countries. And if you're wondering why we don't use the term second world countries, yeah, those are the ones we call developing nations. Some may have been developing for decades, still not developed. I guess there's no money in it. So world trade means goods have to get from place to place. Global supply chain. A good part of world trade depends on consumerism. The consumer reactionary arbitrary purchase. Crap for short. We want our crap. And we want it now. And boy, it would be nice if it was convenient and right around the corner. Or if you can just deliver it to my doorstep, that would be even better. Wait, what's that? You can? Okay, let's do it. I call it strawberries in winter. I know it's winter, but there's got to be strawberries somewhere. Get them to me now. Listen, I understand that nations are going to need things from each other. Not everyone has everything. Importers? exporters. But rampant and sometimes even conspicuous consumerism contributes negatively to world economies. World trade doesn't exist because that's how we survive as a global community, although that may have been the original intent. It exists because of greed. 
Nations are tied up in international trade agreements. Canada alone has 14 with Mexico and the US, you know, the new NAFTA, whatever we call it now. Canada EU, Canada UK, Canada South America, Canada Pacific Rim nations, and on and on. Countries all over the world are so tied up in trade, it's difficult to define what they even do for themselves other than trade. This is not about nationalism, by the way. I couldn't care less about that. By Canadian, by American. Like patriotism is about consumerism. Come on. This is about countries creating an economic foundation less dependent on world trade and a shaky global supply chain. As I see it, there are two main things that have affected this global supply chain. Remember, a delicate and finicky beast to begin with. One, of course, is the pandemic. People spend their money on two things, goods and services. With the pandemic, services shut down. We weren't allowed to go anywhere, and people weren't allowed to come to our homes. So what money we had, we spent on goods. Can't go anywhere, can't do anything. Let's stay home and buy something. Crap goods. And those goods had to be delivered. And because of world trade, generally speaking, goods no longer originated down the street. They came from halfway around the world. And normally that's fine because, you know, we invented those bigger boats and those faster planes. But suddenly we needed many more of them. Second, of course, is climate change. Huge. Massive hundred-year storms every few months. Wildfires, too. There goes that road, that section of track. Cargo ships are tossed around the ocean like a rubber ducky in a bathtub. Throw in something like a ship getting stuck sideways in the canal. And supply chain disrupted. We saw them, hundreds of heavily laden cargo ships just moored off the loading docks near the coastal ports of the country. And here's a word I learned during this. Demerge. After a while, they charge demerge. It's a fee. It's like a taxi meter that's still running while you just pop into the store. You know, you promised to unload my ship by Tuesday. I'll cut you a little bit of slack, but, uh, you know, I got fuel and a crew to pay for here, and it's Friday. I'm going to start charging you extra to merge. Sooner or later, those costs are passed on to the consumer. And then, like we couldn't have seen this coming, a shortage of truck drivers. Why? Well, first, it's a special skill. Moving tons of goods on 18 wheels across the narrow ribbons of highway. And this special skill is underpaid for the sake of profits. Largely... Truckers just began looking for other jobs with better pay, better benefits, better lifestyle. Well, how are we doing on those self-driving trucks? Oh, yeah, still years away, if ever. Sorry, Neil Page, we'd have better luck playing pickup sticks with our butt cheeks than to find a trucker to haul this stuff across country. I'm saying you are stuck in Wichita. I was watching an interview with this furniture maker in California, thriving family business over many generations. During COVID, people were sprucing up their homes, so business should be booming. But suddenly, the screws that he needed to finish building the sofa weren't coming in from China. Couldn't just run to the hardware store for another bag of screws, because they wouldn't fit. Unless he retools the entire plant, no money for that. He was trying to source some from closer to home. He found some, but they couldn't get a truckload promised with any kind of expediency. Income lost. Job cuts. Those incomes are lost. Global supply chain. Global supply chain counts on the planet to work like it should. But Earth is fighting back right now. Captains of industry destroying it and its atmosphere for so long that the Earth is James tailoring us now. How about you see fire and you see rain? 
How do we fix the global supply chain? Well, I might have a few ideas, but even before that, is anybody really interested in fixing it? Because the obvious answers are, end the pandemic and solve climate change. Yeah, how's that gonna happen? And I love those people who say, well, what's the president doing about it? What is the prime minister going to do? When it comes to a business, politicians are generally people of little influence. They can do little things. They can make moves to get themselves reelected to hold on to a power they don't really have. Yeah, it's bleak, isn't it? The media is not particularly interested in helping, or they seem very confused. I remember the same news anchors lamenting the end of the world, championing Greta Thunberg and the COP26. Until about a week later, when they told me how sad it was that people couldn't afford expensive gasoline and how some people couldn't fill up their tanks to get home for the holidays. Aww. What's even worse is, this reporting didn't seem the least bit contradictory to them. So I guess it's up to you and me. Why is it always up to you and me? Well, it isn't always up to you and me. It's just up to you and me now. And what do you and me do? I haven't the foggiest. There has been this initiative over the last couple of years to buy local... And if you're a company to source local, I applaud that, at least until I want strawberries in winter. You know, there's restaurants now that grow their own vegetables and even raise their own chickens. But even they, sooner or later, might need a bag of screws from China. I mean, Doobie's Taxiola is fine for getting around town, you know, but uh, there's folks that need to get to Chicago by Thursday. And it doesn't help right now that one of the richest men in the world based his entire fortune on moving goods from one place to another. He's made the global supply chain idea even more accessible to the everyday consumer. Therefore, more people become dependent on it. Often, the local guy can't even compete. So why bother? It's like we were already complicit, but now even more so. And Bezos is now working to help conquer space. Yes, let's make this a universal interplanetary supply chain. What could go wrong? So back to you and me. How do we end the pandemic and, you know, solve climate change and fix the global supply chain issues? Buy less? You know, there's a line from a poem by Emily Dickinson. It's about love and it goes, The heart wants what it wants. I kind of feel that way about the modern-day consumer, and I include me in that. I can talk a good game, but I want what I want. How do you change that? Especially when there's an entire industry based around selling you something. You know, Neil Page was in marketing, Dale Griffith in sales, shower curtain rings, best in the business. The global supply chain is not only suffering under climate change, its carbon footprint helped cause it. It's creating its own problems. And like I said, Earth is fighting back right now with fire and rain. Comedian Dennis Miller used to do a joke about how he was helping the environment by driving the biggest gas-guzzling SUV possible. Because, as he suggested, we'll never stop using fossil fuels until they're gone. So the best way is for all of us to use them up as quickly as possible. Well, that was satire. He was joking. But doesn't it feel sometimes like that's our best plan? Oil and world trade are hand in hand. Because oil is usually found where it's not needed and needed most where it can't be found. Fossil fuels only encourage the global supply chain. Some countries have oil and coal, others don't. You know, it's funny because the sun shines on the entire planet. A huge ball of fiery energy that's supposed to last millions of years. And we don't really use it to its full potential. Odd. So you and me will put our little plastics in the blue bin, but then only a small percentage of them actually get recycled. We can plug our electric car into the charging station, 
only to find out it's being powered by a coal plant. Earth is estimated to be about 4.5 billion years old. Homo sapiens on the planet for about 30,000 years. And it took modern man only about 250 years to get the planet to this sorry state. It's and it seems like we don't have 250 years to get us out of trouble. I am glad that we are at least becoming more aware of things like world trade, global supply chain, climate change. At least we're talking about it. There is a greater awareness. Small start, maybe too little, too late. I don't know. But in the conversation, we should not wonder how to fix the problem with the global supply chain. We should understand that the global supply chain is the problem. Again, we end up with easy answers to big problems, albeit expensive, but easy. We just need the will to change socio-economic, environmental change. And quickly, or six bucks in my right nut says we won't have a planet. Later That Same Life is written, voiced, and produced by Larry Fedorik. LarryFedorik37 at gmail.com. Subscribe to Larry's podcast YouTube channel. Get automatic notifications with each new episode.